Hi, this is Captain Andrew from Sailor's Delight Back Bay Fishing of Wildwood, New Jersey. Now I'm welcoming you to one of our segments called Fish Stories, where I give everybody a lowdown and entertaining breakdown of my life's experiences in both the fishing and merchant marine world. Uh, now some of the names and locations have been changed for privacy reasons, but I assure you that everything I'm about to tell you is the truth as I saw it. In this episode of Fish Stories, I'm going to talk about seafood, and not just local New Jersey seafood, but I've been fortunate to have been all around the world, and I've had some pretty amazing meals in my life. Uh, really, it all started out, you know, my family was working poor. Uh, we always had fish, though, and we always had venison, but I was always more partial to the fish. I enjoy venison, but if I, given the two, I'm going to go towards the seafood. Uh, so growing up, uh, I, I started working in the party boat industry when I was around 12 as a bait boy, and by the time I was 16, I was a full-fledged, full-share mate, uh, and even in, I was the deck boss at night on some of the party boats. So I always had access to the seafood, and by the time I was 16, during the summer, I was staying down in Wildwood by myself, uh, so I had to make my own meals, and I ate some pretty bad meals in the beginning, but I taught myself how to cook. I remembered how, watching my mom cook and I created my own recipes and it's always gone from there. Now with that said, in my life there's two things I will always choose over anything else. Croaker and scallops. Growing up in, you know, growing up working in Cape May County, you always had probably the best scallops I've ever had anywhere in the world were always in Cape May County. And croaker, well, Croaker were one of the easiest fish for me to swipe from a customer because we often had customers where they would get a bunch and they didn't want all of them. So I was always fortunate that I could take some croaker home with me and I would have a meal. On top of it, croaker were so plentiful in our areas at times that I was even able to then sell croaker to a few local restaurants for $2 a pound. But uh, anyway, I digress. So. I will always have an affinity for Cape May, scallops, and croaker. Now, before I, I branch off and say what my absolute favorite seafood in the world was, one of the things that really changed my palate was working in the Pacific. Uh, for those that don't know, I worked in Alaska out of Seattle for about three years. Uh, I've, I've seen king crab recipes in every variation that you can imagine, but, and I'm salivating just thinking about it, but one of the best seafood meals I've ever had in my life was at a, basically a dive bar in Bollard, Washington, north of Seattle, called The Lock Spot. And this is significant because they had a smoked salmon chowder. Now, anybody that knows me knows that I have a hard time with salmon. I used to love it. I had a bad piece probably about 15 years ago, going on 20 years ago now. Wow, now that I think about it. But I can eat it raw. I can eat it smoked. But if it's cooked in any way, shape, or form, the memory and that, that stomach reaction of the bad seafood always comes back to haunt me. So the idea of eating cooked salmon to me would be terrible but I uh, I listened to everybody and I tried the smoked salmon chowder at the lock spot in Bollard Washington and I tell you what I right now sitting here recording this I wish I could have some Seattle was nice because there was a lot it was my exposure to a whole other ocean uh, now I had crisscross at this point in my life I had crisscrossed the Atlantic probably oh, I don't know, six or seven times. Uh, I grew up working in the Atlantic, so I was used to a whole palette of Atlantic seafood. Now moving to the Pacific and working in the Pacific, especially working the Pacific North, Northwest, I was exposed to a whole different world of seafood. Uh, like I said, king crab of every variation and recipe that you could think of. Uh, but it was here in the Pacific Northwest that I really got turned on to fish throats and cheek meat. Uh, now it's surprising because people in New Jersey do cheek out large bluefish, but I tell you what, it doesn't matter how big or small the fish is, is if you can get that cheek meat, go for it. Now I bring that up because in the Pacific Northwest, uh, halibut, everybody knows halibut, but the most coveted part of the halibut 
is the cheek meat. Whereas normally, uh, uh, you know, you could see halibut steaks or halibut fillets or chunks or however they do it, uh, anywhere from 10 to 15 dollars a pound at the time. Cheek meats, if you could find them, if they weren't immediately taken by the crew of the fishing boats, uh, cheek meats were going for about twenty dollars a pound. And if you know what a halibut is, it's a a hundred pound plus flatfish a cheek one cheek may weigh half a pound uh, but if you were fortunate enough to get a hold of one and just cook it very basically it didn't require any extra spices or salts or anything like that it was the absolute most divine tender sweet white meat of a fish you'll ever have and you know that that throws down against anything cod sea bass striped bass, any white meat that you may encounter on the U.S. East Coast. Uh, one fun caveat uh, about king crab. People don't realize king crab have a tail. Uh, similar to a lobster, uh, when a king crab's alive, they have this tail that it curls underneath the carapace. In the same way that the little triangle or, or pointy shaped piece of a carapace of a blue crab, but in a king crab, it's much more massive. What the local fishermen do in the Pacific Northwest and is they'll take these tails, which are generally just discarded, uh, and they'll take them, boil them, and then they'll pickle them. And I tell you what, uh, the idea of pickled seafood turns a lot of people off, but if you can ever find the opportunity or find a way to do it, even if you want to use some king crab legs themselves, pickle them, you will not be sorry. Uh, as far as now moving back to the back to the Atlantic, the best seafood I have ever, ever had in my life as far as quality, variety, freshness, harvest methods of harvest, just phenomenal. And again, here I'm still salivating after talking about the smoked salmon chowder. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Uh, the best seafood hands down anywhere in the world that I've ever experienced was in Portugal. Uh, now, a lot of people overlook Portugal as far as Europe. Uh, now, I've been all through the Mediterranean. I've been all through the Norwegian states, the Scandinavian states. Uh, the best seafood, hands down, was Portugal. Now, they had the usual fare, uh, you know, shellfish, crabs, flatfish, bream, which are their versions of porgies, uh, fish that, if you look at them, would look very similar to what we would catch here on the Atlantic side, uh, and, and even bluefish. Bluefish, people don't realize bluefish are a cosmopolitan species to the world. I have seen bluefish in Indonesia, I have seen bluefish in Africa, I've seen bluefish basically everywhere except for the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but anyway, uh, carrying on. One of the, 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 I want to hype this all up because this also leads to one of the most unusual seafoods I've ever had, which was gooseneck barnacles. I'm going to let that sink in a second. Gooseneck barnacles. They were mind-numbingly expensive. You're talking probably 25 euros a kilogram. And just think about it. It's a barnacle with a long neck and the little shell carapace that people will actually go down to the rocks and piers and they will take paring knives or clamming knives and cut them off, boil them or saute them. And it is mind numbingly expensive. But I will say this, I wish we had something comparable here on the American East Coast because they were phenomenal. It was sweet and salty and it had a very crisp, clean flavor. And again, I, the only reason we even ventured this is there were three of us and we split the bill and we just said, well, screw it. Let's go for it. It was me, a British guy by the name of Gordy King and a German by the name of Pat Troutner that I was working with. And uh, we went to this restaurant on the recommendation of the locals. And it was then the locals at the restaurant that insisted we try this. And between the squid and pulpo and crabs and whelks and large flatfish called turbot and everything else of this feast that we ate then they pulled out these barnacles on us and we just had to try them and i tell you what again probably that would be in my opinion the best seafood i've ever had in my life in the world 
Now, many fish species are cosmopolitan throughout the world. You have certain species, like I mentioned, bluefish, that you'll find in an unaltered form all over the world. Uh, but there are also species that are very similarly related that you'll find in one area that you'll find a subspecies or a different species, but incredibly similar uh, in another. Like, think of it this way, like the difference between a weak fish and a sea trout or, you know, a summer flounder versus a four spot flounder. Very closely related, but different. Now, with that said, I'm going to talk about Italy, Genoa, Italy specifically, and a restaurant called Malavecchio in Genoa. So, Genoa, Italy was the very first country I ever traveled abroad to. I sailed in it, sailed to it as a cadet uh, aboard the training ship Empire State from New York, to, well, actually from New York to Norfolk and then Norfolk to Genoa. And my first Liberty Day, me and my friend, Paul, friends, Paul Mamoli and Tristan Schultz went out and we found a restaurant called Malavecchio. Uh, so we went in and it was a typical Italian seafood Mediterranean restaurant. Uh, so me not knowing much, uh, listened to my friend Paul, uh, Paul Mamoli. Uh, who is Italian, and the one, one of the few Italian words he understood was soup de pace, which is a fish soup. So I ordered it. And this was my first experience with foreign seafood. Uh, filleting and removing heads from shrimp and stuff, that's all a very American thing. We don't like to look at our food. The rest of the world doesn't care. If you get a fish abroad, uh, it's probably going to be whole. If you get shrimp or prawns or crabs, abroad it's going to be intact there's not going to be any there, there's not going to be any preparation because it's waste and you know they don't waste fish so so as i'm eating this delicious soup i notice there's a whole fish in it which didn't bother me i was adventurous i could see the tail sticking out as i got the level of the soup down a little bit and i kept going and you know occasionally picking meat off the bone and uh as the level got down, I started to notice something about the fish I was eating. Uh, once I got the level down far enough, I scooped the head up and lo and behold, I had a shocking sight staring back at me. I was eating a stargazer. Fortunately, it was only a figurative shock and not a literal shock because stargazers are known to have a little an electrode on the top of the base of their head. But obviously, as the fish was dead and cooked, I, it was not an issue. It's funny how something considered a pesky trash fish in the United States was a delicious delicacy in Italy. Now pretty much everywhere in the world that I've been to, except for the United States, when you go into a fish market, it's kind of a shock uh, because you have whole uncut animals. You don't have nice pretty fillets. All the shellfish still have all their body parts and that includes shrimp heads and bodies and whatnot. And that never really bothered me, but it is a shell shock to a lot of people. And I do have to say that I did enjoy the cuisine down in Southeast Asia, out through Indonesia, and down in Bali, and especially in Singapore. I ate myself stupid in Singapore. Uh, but uh, the one food item, seafood-wise, that I did encounter that I will never try again, that I did not like, and I will say I absolutely will not try in any iteration, was sea urchin. Uh, and that actually brings it back to the United States, and that'll be the last thing we talk about. Uh, the one seafood I will not eat is sea urchin sushi. I had some in a really top-rate sushi place uh, in Seattle years ago when I worked there and I'm very adventurous and I even salmon which bothers my stomach uh, in some ways uh, even I'll even eat salmon but sea urchin was it was an experience uh, I choked down two pieces of it to be polite to the host of the sushi place uh, there's really no nice way to put it so it's it, it tastes like you're eating a phlegm ball both in consistency and flavor, but a phlegm ball that had been dropped in salt, I think is the best way to describe it. And I later found out that it is mostly reproductive organ of sea urchin that you're eating in sea urchin sushi. I think they call it uni, U-N-I, uni. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's how I'm gonna wrap that up, uh, that little nice little mental image. <laughs> 
Now I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you enjoy my channel here and if you do please don't hesitate to like and subscribe and feel free to leave me comments. I do enjoy all sorts of feedback both positive and negative and don't be afraid to share. Thank you very much. Tight lines and good fishing.